Hey everyone, welcome to Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles, together and solo, and all things Beatles related as well. I'm Darren DeVivo. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City. WFUV is a non-commercial public radio station broadcasting at 90.7 FM. And you can also listen on our website. We have an app you can listen. I've been at WFUV now for almost... 40 years, but hey, who's counting? And I'm one of your hosts here uh, on Things We Said Today, and I'm joined by the other two hosts, my dear friends. Uh, you know, um, this guy is a longtime radio personality who has dedicated most of his some 40 years of broadcasting to uh, the Beatles, hosting a variety of Beatles-oriented programming programs. Um, and these days, he's the host of the syndicated show, Every Little Thing. And he's also part of another podcast, a video cast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Um, I think you know who I'm talking about. It's Ken Michaels. How are you, Ken? I'm good, Darren. Good to see you. Good to be healthy once again. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Fully and, healthy. Uh, uh, I rather hope. Our other host is uh, Alan Cozen, the acclaimed writer, journalist, music critic. He spent some 40 odd years at the New York Times, well, not at the New York Times, but writing, uh, contributing to the New York Times, a lot of classical uh, pieces, writing about the Beatles. More recent years, his works have popped up not only in the Times, but in the Wall Street Journal. He has several Beatle books under his belt, and the one we're all waiting for coming out later this year. The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. Ladies and gentlemen, you know him, you love him, you can't live without him. Alan Cozen. <laughs> Hi, Alan. Hey, Darren. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. Hey, Alan. So now that we all remember who we are and what we're going to remain, let's go to Ken, because you know um, uh, you know, Ken's got news. And at the beginning of our show, it's... News time. You don't want to tell you don't want to tell uh, our viewers what the show's about. Um, no, we'll leave them hanging because we don't know what the show's about. Actually, okay. folks, we're just scrambling right now for a topic. No, we'll. Uh, I'll, should I tell them? Yeah, why not? Yeah, okay. Happy 40th anniversary to Tug of War. We're going to concentrate on Paul McCartney's Tug of War album. Um, an album that most uh, McCartney fans hold in very high regard. Some consider it amongst his best works, if not his best album. Um, but I don't agree. And we'll talk about why and all other things tug of war in a few. But Ken, the news first. You're going to leave everyone in suspense now. All that. right. You want me to do the whole show now and then we'll do the news? <laughs> well, the news is actually quite brief because the last show that we did, it went on for hours. So um, this will just be a few minutes here. But as everyone knows, Paul McCartney kicked off his Got Back tour in Spokane, Washington last Thursday night. And a few days before that, he actually went on Twitter and asked his fans if there's any songs that could suggest that they'd like for him to do in concert. Although I'm sure he was sent a list of songs based on his first concert, and the next two that followed, his set list didn't vary too much at all. We're going to talk about his set list at the end of the newscast here. All right. Just released digitally is a new song from the Umoza Music Project, an African band from Malawi. Paul plays bass on their song called Home, which is the title track to their new album due out May 27th. Paul recorded his bass during the worldwide lockdown at his home studio, and the album features singers on the banks of Lake Malawi collaborating with other musicians, many of which are from the UK. Really interesting song. I think it's very good, and you can actually hear a little bit of a bass solo towards the end of that recording, which you can all check out on YouTube. Again, it's called Home, the Umoza, U-M-O-Z-A, Music Project. On April 23rd, Paul also posted a photo from Linda of him with George Harrison and George Martin 
for St. George's Day. And Paul wrote, for the Georges I have known and loved, have a great St. George's Day. Really nice touch there. I don't think I've seen that photo before. Uh, with special thanks to one of our listeners, Nick Butler, we learned that many of the albums released on the Dark Horse label, besides George, are now available for streaming on all platforms, including Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, Amazon, and so on. This means artists like Splinter, Jim Horn, Ravi Shankar, Attitudes, The Stair Steps, Jiva, and Henry McCullough. A lot of stuff there worth exploring, some with participation from George. And a reminder that Olivia Harrison's book of 20 poems for George called Came the Lightning, it's actually not like lightning and thunder, it's lightning. Uh, will be out June 21st as a mass market item for $35, $35 from Genesis Publications. There'll also be a collector's copy version and a deluxe version as well, all of which are detailed on the publisher's website, which is genesis-publications.com. Just learned that uh, the Beatles and India documentary for which we did an interview with Pete Compton co-director for the documentary. It is coming out on DVD and Blu-ray. It is due out June the 21st. You could actually pre-order it right now on Amazon. And uh, as far as I know, it should still be running on uh, the cable channel BritBox. Our listener, Greg Thurman, let us know that the May issue of Recording Magazine includes a nine-page article on Get Back, the documentary, and the technical side of it written by Mark Hornsby. Uh, with thanks to our colleague, Ken Womack, we find out that there is a new book out called The Rise and Fall of Father Lennon, all about John's great uncle, William George Lennon. It's written by Philip Kirkland and Ken Womack himself has written the foreword for it. It is available to order right now on paperback and Kindle on Amazon. Willie Nelson has just released a brand new album, which is called The Beautiful Time, in which he's covered the Beatle classic with a little help from my friends. Willie also recently covered All Things Must Pass on the album The Willie Nelson Family, which came out last November. And going back to the tribute album to Paul called The Art of McCartney, you might recall he covered yesterday. yesterday. Uh, three weeks ago, we got to hear 20 seconds of a demo that Paul McCartney made of the song Attention, which he gave to Ringo for what was to be a Stop and Smell of the Roses album. Paul and Linda appear on three songs on that album, and this demo was given to saxophonist Howie Casey to prepare him for the sessions. Howie submitted for an auction for Omega Auctions, which took place on April the 26th. This demo was on a Maxell 660 cassette tape with handwritten labels. The back of the cassette lists, handwritten, the songs, Attention, the Carl Perkins song, Short of Fall, which Paul recorded with Ringo for the album, and the song, Route 66, but next to it saying the name Berry, as in Chuck Berry, even though Chuck didn't write it, Chuck did record Route 66. The entire demo of Attention runs four minutes and two seconds. What you can hear on YouTube is just 20 seconds of it. And uh, finally, still no word on the forthcoming archival box set for some time in New York City. We're hoping to hear something because June will mark the actual uh, 50th anniversary for the album for its release here in the U.S. All right. That's all the news. Told you it'd be brief. Wow. That's all the news? That's it. <clears throat> wow. Interesting. Well, I had several years worth of news on the last show. <laughs> all right. Out. Well, on to, um, on to uh, our topic today. Were you going to talk about the set list? Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, Paul McCartney's set list did not vary too much from his last set list before covid and did you want me to read all the songs guys yes so if you want to so if this, this is a spoiler alert for anyone who still goes to the trouble of not wanting to find out before they go and see paul perform this was the first concert and in the second and third concerts he made a few slight changes started with can't buy me love next it was junior's farm letting go 
got to get you into my life. Come on to me. Let me roll it going into Foxy Lady. He's still doing that. Hmm. Getting better. The only song from McCartney 3, Women and Wives. I can't believe he's not doing Find My Way. Anyway, uh, My Valentine, he's continuing to do, 1985. Maybe I'm amazed. I've just seen a face in spite of all the danger. He's still doing that one. Love Me Do, Dance Tonight, Blackbird, Here Today, Queenie Eye from the new album, Lady Madonna. What's that? I thought you said something. One of you guys said something. Um, Lady Madonna, Fa You from Me Dip Station. Being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, something, oh, blah, dee, oh, blah, da, you never give me your money. Uh, that's the first time since 2003 he's doing that. She came in through the bathroom window, first time since 2008. Get back, Ben on the run, let it be, live and let die. Hey, Jude. And then the encore, I've got a feeling, birthday, helter skelter, and golden slumbers carry that weight and the end. Also, I should point out that Getting Better, the that's the first time he's done the song since 2003. Now, this was um, in Spokane, like I said. Uh, he did two shows in Seattle. Um, he did them the last two nights, May 2nd and 3rd. The only changes he made uh, for the May 2nd show, he performed new instead of Queenie Eye. And last night, May 3rd, he performed Let Him In instead of Women and Wives. So we didn't do anything from McCartney 3 in the show. He also did We Can Work It Out instead of I've Just Seen a Face. So this is kind of similar in a way to what Paul has done in the past. If you go to two shows in a row, chances are he'll make some slight adjustment. He'll take out one song and put in another one. You know, if you've studied what he's done in recent years, like he'll do I've Just Seen a Face and then maybe... The next night he'll do I'm Looking Through You. Um, and I Love Her is another song that he switches around, Things We Said Today, and here in the case of We Can Work It Out. Um, and surprising that he would take out Women and Wives, so there was no representation of McCartney 3, but that's in the May 3rd show. He could change it up from show to show. And um, we should also point out that um, this is, there may be another leg of this tour too. This is not like, you know, whatever we hear now, that's it. Right. So did you guys want to comment about this, the set list? Are you happy with it? Or are you? I think the one thing we have to comment on at least is um, um, I've got a feeling. Yes. Um, because yeah. he does that with uh, John from the rooftop concert projected on the screen and the vocal isolation of John singing his middle part uh and uh so you have a, a duet and it, it actually from the recordings i've heard sounded pretty good hmm. um and it's it's one of those things that you know i mean it's sort of like a, a topic now going you know i guess back to natalie cole doing duets with her father you know um, the, this business of uh, resurrecting a you know a dead person to sing with a, a living person um, and they've been doing lately things with holograms which people really I think generally find a little weirdly ghoulish um, hmm. this from you know I mean in, in my opinion and uh, in most of the opinions I've read so far um, this seems to be pretty unobjectionable you know I mean He's singing with a, a, vocal, a, a vocal isolation and, and there happens to be film of when that vocal was recorded. So, uh, you know, it's it's uh, the the John and Paul reunion that never happened in real life, you know, for a few minutes there. I, I thought it was a nice touch, really. Yeah, I think it's kind of clever. I've seen this, this kind of thing being done several times. I remember back... Um, after Gordon Waller passed away, oh. uh, Peter would Peter Asher would give concerts and he would show uh, TV performances of Peter and Gordon, and then you would hear Gordon sing his part to go with Peter. The things that you can do now mm. with technology, you know, uh, this this is I look at it as a tribute, as a way to John. 
in addition to doing here today. Um, it's, it's a nice touch. You know, it, it doesn't shock me considering the fact that other artists have done that. Right. Yeah, I kind of agree with, with both of you. I tend to not like uh, the sort of gimmicky, even that's not maybe the accurate word, but these sort of gimmicky touches where, you know, somebody will do a duet with a musician who's passed. Or, uh, you know, like you mentioned, the hologram, which I think is what, I don't know if they've done it yet, but I think that was Abba's plan for this reunion that they were going to do. Although in the case of Abba, I think there's such a phenomenon uh, that the, uh, a hologram so the tour concert uh, actually could be a lot of fun and could work just because of who and what ABBA is as, as an entity. Mm. But for the most part, I tend to be very skeptical of, of these. I made it a point to really not watch any of the video online. I caught maybe seconds of it. It was intriguing, but I I thought, you know, for, for several reasons. Number one, I want to be surprised. I want to see it for real when I go see him at MetLife Stadium. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's, like I said, it's not really a, a, a practice that really knocks me out. I can't think of a time that I really enjoyed, you know, hearing technology bring two artists together. Um so uh, but fundamentally, I'm, you know, I'm keeping an open mind with this because it does look like it's a little different than what has been done in mm. uh, in the past. Yeah. So and definitely. it's basically the middle eight of one yeah. song in a concert that runs about two hours and 45 minutes. So, yeah. he, you know, it's not like he's doing the whole concert with John. I mean, so. I have my problem. My, I have other problems of the common complaints about this tour that that's probably the least uh, of the things I'm concerned about or, you know, wondering about, you know, the set list. I do understand that Paul really does not a lot. He's got so many classic songs. He has to do two thirds of his set may, you know, has to be done. I get it. Okay. But. Oh, all right. Half of his set has to be done. Um, oh, there, maybe a third. But, <laughs> you know, there's, I think you would be, well, I think we would be a little more willing to embrace a rep- repetitive set list if we didn't, if, if we knew that the, the shtick that goes around all the songs is going to be changed. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to hear the Jimi Hendrix story anymore mm-hmm. uh, tied into Foxy Lady. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want him coming out with all the flags of the nations they've played or whatever the deal is. I, you know, I don't want to hear the story about Blackboard, you know. Um, because you know they're coming. You know, you look at the set list, and I'm thinking more along the lines up, he's going to tell that story. He's going to tell this story too. Yeah. And I don't like being negative. This is Paul McCartney, but mm-hmm. I'm here, not physically, uh, but I'm doing this. My, I, this is my, my career is directly or indirectly the result of being a McCartney fanatic. I don't like being critical, but it's just like after so many years and it's, I feel it's my duty. I want to see the shows when he comes through New York city. I go see them all. If I can, I've seen most of them. The bad, the B side of that is everything that's repetitive really is repetitive, whether it be a set list or shtick or, you know, whatever the case might be. And then I won't even get into the voice thing because I don't know what to think about that. Uh, he didn't even, it doesn't even look like he's attempted to back away from things that he cannot sing anymore. And I was holding out hope that perhaps in the time away from the stage that maybe, I don't even know if this is possible, but that he went maybe to a vocal coach or did some practices or exercises to try to strengthen what he has left. It does not, from what I've seen, the little I've watched online, it does not look like his voice is in good shape and you know he hasn't doesn't sound like he's done much to help it it kills me to say this but you know but i'm there at metlife stadium so you know in terms of flags uh, in spokane i don't know about seattle i haven't seen the video for it but he came out with the ukrainian flag at the end that's different see in this instance 
that's fantastic. But when, you know, he plays in New York and he comes out with the New York state flag, I think he's done that. The state, I, I don't even know what the New York state flag looks like. I mean, what's the point? You know, um, big blues has the, Excelsior yeah, yeah it's got the thing in the middle. Don't tread on me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> or whatever that is. It's like, that doesn't, it doesn't, it's it, once or twice. Great. Next, okay. you know, let's, you know, come up with something a little different to open an, 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 the encore. Hmm. Again, it kills me to be negative, but. I know how you feel. I'm torn between, there's two sides of me. The one side that says, we should be grateful that Paul is doing anything at this point. You know, he's about to turn 80 years old. Time is precious. His life is precious. You know, he's got a family that he loves that I think, you know, if he wanted to spend every single moment for the rest of his life with Nancy or his kids or his grandkids, he has every single right to do that. He doesn't owe us a thing. He doesn't owe us a concert. He doesn't owe us a new album. He owes us nothing. So the fact that he's spending any time with us, a night with us, on the one hand, I feel so grateful that he's doing that. But at the same time, the person that studied every single song he's ever given us and realizes that he's got so many great songs in his back pocket that he can whip out, you know, and so many that were hit records, many of which he's never done live before. You know, I don't see why there can't be more of a compromise, yeah. why he can't do, um, you know, I've said this so many times that you know, he's got three number one hits in the United States that he's never done live before. What other artist in music history can have that kind of a luxury that they decide that they're not going to play those songs? <laughs> he's never done Uncle Albert Admiral Halls. He's never done With a Little Look. He's never done Say, Say, Say. Of course, you got a question who would sing Say, Say, Say with him. But there's so many great songs in his arsenal that he can that he can do. You know, I certainly wouldn't mind if he did some Beatles songs that he's never done live before. I wouldn't mind if he did something different as tributes to John and George other than Here Today and Something, which he's been doing now for about 20 years. And I know Here Today is a very important song for Paul, very touching, very emotional. It means a lot to him to be able to do it. And sometimes, you know, you can even hear the emotion in his voice and he cracks up during the song because it's tough for him to deal with what he's, you know, saying in the song. It's so deeply personal. And it's great to see him do something, but there's so many other songs you could do from John and yeah, George. The three, the three of us put together set lists for him and did he pay any attention to us? No. Oh. <laughs> I knew fully well that my set list, which was all <laughs> songs he's never done live before, right. is a pipe dream. But play two of those songs. <laughs> you know, I, It's not asking a lot, I don't think. But um, at the same time, I also feel that he's at a stage probably where he feels he just wants to go out, enjoy himself. He knows there are people out there that have never seen him live before. There are millions of people like that, hard to believe, that have never seen a Beatle live before and he's out there to please and he knows that his concerts are crowd pleasers and they affect a lot of people and they're so happy to see him and he feeds off of that and he loves it and if this brings him joy despite the hundreds of concerts he's given in his lifetime if it still brings him this kind of happiness do it yeah uh, just uh, you know as a fan I just wish that he would acknowledge, especially in his solo career, you know, so many other great songs that he's done that he's never done live before and, and probably never will. Yeah. The thing that um, Darren mentioned about the between song shtick, hmm. um, I, I once asked him about that, actually. Um, it was in, you know, right after the 1989 tour. And it just, you know, this is the downside from a performer's point of view of people who, listen to every bootlegged performance, you know, because having heard them all, you know, you heard the stories every time. And then, you know, 89, he hadn't been on tour for a while. So these were, you know, this was sort of new com compared with now where he's been pretty consistently out there. Um, and it, it, it seemed to me that, okay, you know, probably the reason he's telling the stories, exact same stories in between, the exact same songs is, is that because, you know, you, you know that you've got 90 seconds for the lighting array to move from here to there. So he's got a 90 second story 
to go in there. But, you know, I asked anyway, you know, why is it that like, you know, every night it's, uh, you know, introducing Linda's Gertrude Higgins, for instance. Um, and he, fo- so he, for his answer, he focused on that particular one and, and said, you know, I, the thing about Gertrude Higgins is that, you know, I'm introducing the band and if I just introduce Linda, there's always going to be some wag out there who will, you know, call out something, you know, hurtful. If I introduce her as Gertrude Higgins, it totally, you know, diffuses that, um, you know, and people laugh instead of whatever someone was going to do. Um, mm. I thought that was actually a pretty clever approach to it. I mean, it would be good if he if he did change up some of these stories, Um but like Ken says, there are people who've never seen him. But on the other hand, there are people who've seen him 20 times, you know, who could probably talk about singing along with the songs that get mouth along with the stories, mm. you know, because they, they are the same. And um, well, what can you do? It's like, you know, it's like I've, I've, I've said before, I think there are, there are basically two approaches to doing live shows like this. You know, on one hand, you have Paul who puts together a show and there might be some substitutions from one one night to the next, but it's basically the same, including all the patter in between the songs. Um, This is the show. It's like, it's as if it's a written show, you know? Um, And on the other hand, you have say, you know, Dylan who will do a, a, almost a different set every night or Hendrix who would play two sets a night and they'd both be different. And even if he played the same song, it would be completely different. Um, that seems to be the other extreme, you know, to me, I, I mean, I find that a little more exciting than the totally written out show, but, um, but this is, you know, this is the choice he's made. This is what he feels comfortable doing. And there it is. It's kind of, I also think they're a little looser. I think they're a little looser when they're in small venues, you know, like, like, the up close show or the cavern or, you know, these, these things where you're not also dealing with the lighting moving and the projections behind you on the screen. He, he is a little looser in those. That's why I like those shows better. You know, as someone who's gone to a lot of concerts, there are a lot of veteran artists out there who from tour to tour don't change all that much. Mm. You know, they take out a few songs, they put in a few new ones, but there are certain core songs that they have to play. And they're comfortable with that. You know, they know what their legacy is and they know that there are certain songs that their fans want to hear no matter what. And so, Paul, unfortunately, I, I'm critical of him because I love his entire catalog. There's so much great music. When you're familiar with everything that he's done, you can be far more critical, you know, because you know what the possibilities of what he could do. Um, but it's, it's not an uncommon thing that a lot of artists out there do something like this from tour to tour and don't change it all that much. On the other hand, as someone who is a you know, fairly big fan of Todd Rundgren, that's somebody who from tour to tour does something completely different mm-hmm. almost every single time. Yeah. He has a few core songs that he has to play, but you never know what he's going to do from tour to tour. He calls one of his tours unpredictable, and he is. Mm-hmm. Paul is not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what the tour should be called, not got back. Um, predictable. <laughs> he was going to do all of um, Tug of War, but he heard Darren was going to be at one of the shows, yeah. and he scrapped that idea all immediately. The, all the more reason to do that and Pipes of Peace together. <laughs> so I wouldn't mind that. So is it topic time, I guess? I think so. We've been talking about Paul. We're going to continue talking about Paul uh, as we look at a very, very important album in McCartney's catalog as a solo artist. The album Tug of War released in April of 1982. Uh, So we just passed the uh, uh, 40th anniversary of the album's release. I find it hard to believe that 40 years have gone by, but uh, that is the case. Uh, I remember buying the album uh, when it came out at the uh, whatever chain, small chain Sam Goody Record World in uh, the Nourishell Mall, for those of you who know uh, Westchester County in New York. Um, And um, listen, I 
my, I'll, I'll get to my opinions about what I'm not nuts about and why I'm not nuts about the album overall. But I do totally understand the praise that's been heaped upon it. Uh, this is a, a this was a major album for McCartney from for many reasons uh, and is a, uh, you know, a shining light in his discography. And I have told people that while I think the way I think about the album, I'm in the minority. Uh, listen to it without my opinion uh, and know that many McCartney enthusiasts hold this one up in very high regard. And, um, you know, so before I play the bad guy, though, I guess we should go, you know, and share some thoughts about our individual thoughts about the album, uh, first impressions, later impressions, favorite tracks, what we think about the album. Is it McCartney's best? Is it one of his best or is it overrated? Uh, whatever the case might be. So uh, let's start with, um, we start with Alan. Okay. Um, I think it's one of his best. I, I don't know that I'd say it's his best, um, but it's definitely up there for me. Um, I listened to it, uh, you know, this week preparing for the show. I listened to both the original and the remix. I, I, I don't know that I have an opinion about which is better or, or if I if I did at one point, it may be back in the show we did about the you know deluxe edition coming out. Um, the parts of it, the new one sounded slightly, you know, clearer, all the things that remixes do, but uh, the, the original sounds good to me. Um, the thing about this album and why I think it is one of his best is that um, with a lot of his records, there are some really high points and some, you know, moderately low points, things that, you know, I can't figure out why he put on there because the B-sides of the singles are usually better than what, you know, certain of the songs. I, I don't tend to like his sort of like funk workouts. So, um, you know, the uh, other, well, what's that you're doing on this? Um, normally doesn't do it for me. Um, this time when I listened to the two versions, it, uh, you know, I thought I thought it was OK. I didn't you know, I, I sort of was thinking, you know, I, I normally don't like this song. It, it actually uh, it, it's fine. You know, <laughs> it doesn't bother me. Um, so maybe I'm getting undiscerning in my old age. Uh, the thing about this album is, you know, it comes at kind of a weird time in his career. Uh, a lot of it or some of it in any case was put together and rehearsed with wings. Um, and there are some outtakes and, uh, uh, you know, just sort of working tapes of, of some of them um, going back to, say, 79 or so. Uh, and then there was, you know, the McCartney album, which was a totally solo project. Uh, and then two years from the McCartney album to this. So he had a lot of time to get this together, decide, you know, what kind of thing it was going to be a wings thing or, or a non wings thing. I think there's a degree to which this album has to do with the breakup of wings. Um, he wanted to work with George Martin again and George Martin specifically didn't want it to be a wings album. He wanted it to be a McCartney album. And uh, you know, basically the guys in Wings sort of, I think they understood the McCartney album. Okay, this is something he wants to do. But um, apparently Paul was not all that forthcoming with them about what was going to come next. And so from 19, after 1980, after the Japanese tour, which was a big disappointment to all of them, um, because they were, you know, that was going to be the first leg of a world tour and, uh, and, and none of it happened. And so they're sort of left hanging and Paul's doing this thing with George Martin. They don't know that George Martin doesn't want them. They don't know really what is going to be going on. And um, I think, I think Lawrence Juber read in the British music press that Wings had broken up and no one had, had told him and he called Paul and, and said, um, you know, I read this thing and he's, he's oh yeah, I was going to uh, talk to you guys about that. 
Um, so, you know, this is like, you know, it's, it, you, there's a certain amount of confusion going on. Maybe not so much for Paul. Paul knew what he was doing, but everybody else that he was working with didn't know what they were doing. And, and um, this is what came out of it. And so in a way, um, it's, it's, it's amazing that it's such a good album because, uh, you know, may, maybe George Martin working with him again um, had something to do with it. Maybe doing it, a lot of it in Montserrat at, at George Martin's new air studio there had something to do with it. Um, you know, there were the, the collaborations with Stevie Wonder. Um, and, and that's another, another thing, actually. I, I, Ebony and Ivory, I, I, I was always a little on the fence about. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's the sentiment you can't argue with, um, but it, it just didn't seem to me to be one of his really best songs. Um, but, you know, again, listening to it this time, it actually seemed a good way to close the album, you know, and, and especially if you're, if, if your theme of the album is the, the tug of war thing, um, the sort of uh, collaborative spirit of Ebony and Ivory uh, in the, you know, in, in both small and large elements, you know, I mean, on, on one hand, it's like, you know, racial. And on the other hand, it's like two musicians, um, the keys on the piano, however, you know, you want to look at it. Um, I think that, I think that moving from tug of war down to that through the course of the album um, is kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, and then individually, you know, I think tug of war is a, a really good song. I love take it away. Um, probably a little influenced by the fact that when it came out, that video was on all the time on MTV. I mean, you, you couldn't avoid it. And it, basically told the story that the song tells, you know, and with John Hurd in it, who I also really always liked. And um, so it seemed like a good video. It seemed like a good song. Um, it holds up really well. Um, uh, Somebody Who Cares was one of those um, that never really made a, a firm impression on me. It was sort of like, you know, you're getting onto this area of uh, someone who cares okay, and then what's that you're doing? And so, you know, I'm sort of tuning out in, until here today. But then, you know, this time as, you know, it's probably great not hearing an album for a couple of years sometimes and then going back to it. This time, somebody who cares, um, the, the, the melody of it really just struck me as um, classic McCartney in the way that a, a lot of his best stuff is. Um, so, you know, even that one, which had never made a, a much of an impression on me sort of this time, it, it kind of grabbed me as well. Um, so, you know, I don't want to do every single, um, one, but, you know, dress me up as a robber. It's one of those, another one of those things where the lyrics are a little, you know, off the edge, but, um, as a piece of music, you know, let's just think of the tune and the, and the, the arrangement and the way it, it sounds. It, it's just kind of cool. Wanderlust is beautiful. Pound of Sinking, the same thing as uh, Dress Me Up as a Robber in a way, you know, it's kind of a, a, a weird topic. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, again, melodically, has a lot going for it. Ballroom dancing, you know, had an afterlife in Give My Regards to Broad Street. Um, and it's funny, you know, even though <laughs> Broad Street was two years later, <clears throat> it's hard to think of that song without the video from Broad Street. Um, so anyway, that's basically um, my feeling about it. it. It it really held up well for me this time. And, uh, and I listened to it, to, to the two versions, like, one after another so you know playing the, the same album basically twice in a row and not feeling like okay let's let's get this over with already I, I that that says a lot when you listened back do you go to the vinyl or cd or cd yeah a track no <laughs> i never had a track you know no, neither did i all right uh, well ken uh i know that you love this record 
I do love it. I think it's one of his best. Yeah. I remember thinking at the time I was so impressed by the songs and the production behind it. I mean, I've said this before that when it comes to Paul McCartney with orchestration, with strings or with horns, there is nobody better on the planet than George Martin to work with him. And this album proved it. Um, I'm most impressed with the quality of the songs. I like every single song on the album. Obviously, there are some songs that you consider to be the best ones, and then there are the weakest ones. I think um, Get It is probably the weakest of all the songs on the album, but it's still a very enjoyable tune. And um, so many aspects of this album I like. Uh, I really wish that Paul, and I know a lot of people don't feel this way, I like when Paul collaborates with other people as a songwriter and also when you have duets with him. Um, the duets part I love especially because you get to realize even more what a great singer he is when his voice blends so well with the people that he works with, like Stevie Wonder, like Michael Jackson, like George Michael. Um, and I wish that there would be more songs like that with Elvis Costello. Um, and I've always loved Ebony and Ivory from the get-go. It's a very simple song with a very simple message. And I don't like, you know, how it's been for so many years looked upon as one of the worst records of all time. I don't know whether that reflects the cynicism of our society to have a song like this. Um, but I think with the racism problems that we have these days, I think we need plenty more songs like Ebony and Ivory. And I love what you said there, Alan, about it kind of bookends, you know, with Tug of War um, on the album. But basically what I love most about this album is that all the songs are really strong from the first song to the end. I think Ballroom Dancing, when I think about that song, I can certainly not think about the Broad Street version. Because, <laughs> you know, I grew to love the Tug of War version and it's still my favorite of the two of them such incredible production behind that mm -hmm. but you talk about a song that's so damn catchy and it rates as the number one should have been a single in paul mccartney's canon i really do wish that that song had either been the third single uh of the album instead of tug of war and i also wish that what's that you're doing had been a single because you know ebony ivory was so huge it was number one in the united states for seven weeks more than any other solo hit it was number one, seven weeks. Yeah. And they say, 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 was, say, say was, was six weeks. But, um, you know, you have to think about at that time what worked on the radio. And if Ebony Ivory was a big hit with the two of them, go with the other song. The only problem I've ever had with What's That You're Doing is sometimes I think it goes on a little bit too long. You could probably trim a minute of it. But I do remember at the time that there were R&B stations that played it. Of course, because Stevie Wonder's on it, too. But um, I think that might have caught on as a hit. There could have been the song. The, the album could have had a lot more longevity than it did have. It was really only on the charts, I think, for half a year. Deserved to be on much longer than that. Um, Tug of War should never have been a single. But the songs are just one after the other. Really brilliant. Tug of War, incredible melody, incredible lyrics. The orchestration makes it the way that it segs into uh, Take It Away is classic. Those two songs belong back to back uh, on, uh, on the album. I love the sequencing on this album. Mm -hmm. Somebody Who Cares is vintage McCartney, great acoustic tune. I love the little guitar solo in the middle. The song has a real warmth to it. And there's something about the way that Paul delivers it vocally. It sounds like vintage McCartney. Um, Here Today is a gorgeous song and you know, what can you say? It's so deeply personal for Paul to write that about John. Mm -hmm. And it works using the yesterday approach with just the strings and acoustic guitar and um, a very powerful message uh, delivered in there. I, like I said, I love ballroom dancing. Uh, the Pound is Sinking is a very quirky song. It's one of those songs where you've got a lot of individual songs that are strung together very much like other things that Paul's done, like Band on the Run, 
for example, mm -hmm. or going back to happiness is a warm gun. I always think about that with that song, that it was separate songs strung, strung together, musical pieces strung together that mm -hmm. flow together well. Wanderlust is a masterpiece and the use of the brass on that song was so perfect. The sound, the whole aura of the album is just so wonderful. I love the sound of Paul and Carl Perkins together. Um, and Dress Me Up as a Robber, I think, is an overlooked gem. It's, it kind of reminds me with the Spanish guitar in there, a little bit of Goodnight Tonight. Mm -hmm. You're getting a little bit of a taste of Paul's falsetto voice. I know we had it with Girlfriend. Um, and, and, of course, we're getting it a lot more now these days. But um, overall, the, the reason why I love the album, first and foremost, is that the songs are really good. The performances were great. Production, which is never as important to me as the strength of the songs, the production was as perfect as you could possibly make it for these songs. Um, there is, as you said, Alan, a lot of confusion about whether or not, you know, would this have been a Wings album? What happened with Wings? Um, I have a lot of trouble sometimes accepting the storyline that, yes, I know George Martin wanted Tug of War to be a McCartney album and not a Wings album, but ultimately Paul makes the final decision in everything that he does anyway. So overall, I think probably Paul felt that it was time for, for him to end Wings. Um, I've also heard Lawrence Juber say on several occasions, including the recent interview that we did with him on Talk More Talk, which was at the Fest for Beatle fans, that the material that they were rehearsing then at the end of Wings was more suitable for a solo album than for a Wings album, in his estimation, meaning that he was thinking that, were, that they were designed really for studio recordings, not so much as live recordings, and maybe the material that Paul, a lot of what Paul wrote in Wings was designed to be songs to do live. But yet at the same time, they also rehearsed No Values, you know, which in Broad Street, Paul had a band to do No Values. So, you know, you can go back and forth on it. I also remember um, Linda McCartney later saying that um, Wings had good musicians, but not great musicians and Paul should be working with great musicians. So it just seems like George Martin is part of the reason why it became a solo McCartney album. Linda McCartney comes out and says these words about Wings. It's almost like Paul is not the one saying this publicly. He's letting the others speak for him. So maybe he just felt like, you know, it's the end of the decade, time to move on. Although they were gonna tour, you know, <laughs> um, unfortunately, because of the, the drug bust in Japan, it stopped right there. But there were plans for them to do, you know, more countries. So I, I don't really know for sure what was going on in Paul's head at the time. How much of an influence? I'm sure George Martin was an influence. I'm sure Linda was an influence. But ultimately, if Paul wanted this to be a Wings album, it could have been because, you know, he was the leader. He was the boss. But he went with what the others recommended to him and probably he wanted to go more in that direction. I think I said enough. <laughs> um, I agree with everything the two of you said, uh, and I enjoyed getting your perspective on these two. Picking up where you left off, Ken, um, I've often wondered, OK, uh, could Tug of War have been a Wings album? Um, and, and, and you mentioned something interesting. I can't see a lot of these songs being played live, uh, by wings in a rock and roll band and concert setting. Um, that could be one of the reasons why I couldn't warm up to tug of war like I had in the past. Um, I'm also looking at the, at the, at the, the, the guests that played on the album. By not locking yourself into one band with one drummer, one lead guitarist, you know, um, it allowed McCartney, I think, to uh, explore different styles in different ways. You could do a ballad with strings. You could do a, an upbeat song with a, 
uh, somebody who's kind of walked that line of rock and jazz, Steve Gadd, one of the drummers on the album. Um, hmm. You could get a guy like Stanley Clark in there. Uh, brilliant bass player, one of the greatest of all time. And, um, and, and let, and, and Paul will let somebody else's bass voice be heard. Couldn't, can't do that really. Unless you're Steely Dan, we could have a band and not use any of the members in the band on your recordings, which was the case with a lot of the early stuff. Um, to have wings, you're locked into something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, maybe Lawrence Juber's, uh, uh, hit the nail on the head. It didn't sound like the type of material that a rock band would do. This was a little different. You could say um, that for a lot of the stuff on Back to the Egg, too, though. But Back to the Egg plays like it wants to be a band album. Hmm. You don't, you, I mean, to me, a lot of Back to the Egg is, you know, it's a heavier rock driven album that you would have a rock band play on. Um, and McCartney, the wing, the wings albums all sort of had not a sameness. That's not the right word I'm looking for, but they, each album kind of came off as, uh, fairly cohesive and always had those little McCartney moments. You know, you gave me the answer on Venus and Mars is a perfect example where Paul goes off and he's Paul for mm -hmm. one song, but then it comes back into letting go rock show spirits of ancient egypt uh any of the albums back back to the egg had the rock song rock song rock song then they go off there's the broadcast something a little different there's baby's request tug of war just seems to be the type of album that one rock single rock band would set musicians uh it benefits from having different voices in there um again did a little bit of a stab in the dark and not really it doesn't really have any much to do with my opinion uh, uh, of the record. Um, so I have to go back to, you know, when I was younger to where my mind was at, at the time the tug of war came out um, coming off of back to the egg, which was a great rock record. Uh, McCartney two, I was 15 years old when McCartney two came out. I didn't know really what it was what, what what was paul trying to do with this album mm -hmm. i'd never heard anything like that from any artist um even if it was the debut of a new artist here's their first album you play me mccartney too i'd be like huh uh but coming especially after back to the egg mccartney too really threw me i didn't hate it i didn't like it i've grown to like it and i've grown to love it actually because of the I see where it belongs in his in his catalog. I see why he did what he did, that he didn't necessarily set out to do an album. He just was messing around at home with a lot of downtime, seeing what, you know, throwing stuff against the wall, seeing what sticks. I think we talked about this on the show maybe last year. Uh, it's my belief that if Paul didn't get arrested in Japan, McCartney too would never have come out, at least not in 1980 as a, you know, as what it ended up being because it was not on Paul's radar to put this material out as an album. He would have been busy in 1980 with wings on tour most of the year. Well, remember that they were performing coming up. That's one song though. Yeah. I know that's one song and they did do wonderful Christmas yeah. time over the holidays, mm -hmm. you know, but for the most part, you know, McCartney too was something Paul was messing around, influenced by a lot of new wave. He was hearing some, got some new electronic toys and synthesizers and plays with the speed of his voice and has fun with all that stuff, amasses all of this material and, uh, and then gathers wings and they go out and do some shows at the end of 79. And it sounded like 80 was fairly well planned out and it wasn't going to be a lot of room to time to tinker around with home recordings. Perhaps if Wings continued on, Paul would have taken some time off in 81, you know, and gone through all the stuff that he recorded. Um, that we'll never know. That's, you know. So, you know, by the time 80, early 82 rolls around now, uh, I hear Ebony, I guess that's what we all heard first, because that was the advanced single. Mm -hmm. 
maybe about a month or so before the album came out, Ebony and Ivory had come out. I was a member of the fun club. Uh, and um, I was, I'm sure I was pretty much aware it was coming. It was McCartney with Stevie Wonder. I don't really remember much else of it. I, at that time, really wasn't much of a Stevie Wonder fan. So mm -hmm. Paul collaborating with Stevie Wonder was... I'd rather Paul just, you know, and was wings. You know, I was probably dealing, trying to figure all of this out. Ebony and Ivory comes out. And I, I do remember my early impressions of the song are, it's rather wishy-washy. It was sort of, you know, campfire-ish kind of cutesy. Um, and I couldn't warm up to it because of that. The sentiment, Grand Slam. Ebony and Ivory, I thought, was also a great visual and a great idea for a song. And it is a strong song, but the execution of it, it was soft. You know what I mean? It was not getting embraced by the rock stations I listened to on the radio. You know what I mean? Rock radio was going to start turning its back, as we now know, on not only McCartney, but a lot of veteran acts in the 80s. Um, this was the be maybe the beginning of, of, of that, but it never sounded to me like a song that would work on early 80s rock radio, whether you want to call AOR or classic rock wasn't around yet. Mm -hmm. And then Tug of War comes out. Now, Tug of War visually pops. It's a great looking album. The cover's great looking. The packaging is fabulous. It really, this is going to be good. All right, this is going to be good. And I'd listen to it and all of the songs seem to have that lightweight saccharine feel to it like middle of the road, light FM music, <laughs> um, soft rock. I should say that's a better way of, you know, cause I don't know if everyone knows what light FM means, but although I'm sure many, most radio major markets have a light FM station. Um, Ebony and Ivory was a good sampling of what tug of war was to my ears. Now, early on, I thought it was brilliantly produced and I was thrilled to see Paul with George again. By the time the album came out, actually, I should take back what I said before about being a bit confused about where was Wings with Ebony and Ivory, because we knew Wings were done by the time Tuck of War came out. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you a funny story that probably no one wants to hear, but you're going to hear it anyway, because I'm one of the hosts of the show. And damn it, I'm going to tell the story. Um, I went to uh, an old Catholic boys high school and um, near, in New Rochelle, New York, Salesian High School. Go Eagles. And I was sitting in the church uh, and we wore, it wasn't a mass. It was some sort of rehearsal for some concert or something was going to happen that uh, the whole, uh, all that we walked through the New Rochelle up to the church in the pew. I had my daily news with me, you know, um, and I remember stumbling upon a little mention in the newspaper that Denny Lane had left wings. It had to be the Daily News because I didn't read any of the local paper. And uh, and I let out with an audible what? Mm -hmm. uh, or gasp or something like that. And I think I was like, Denny Lane left wings. <laughs> so at some point in 81, uh, I think it was like it would have been like the spring of 81. It was literally I remember thinking technically their 10th anniversary would have been in a couple of months. Denny Lane left wings? It can't happen. My world, the sense of world order went out the window. Okay. Uh, so by the time Tug of War did come out, we knew wings were done. Um, I didn't quite understand the whole thing at the time. But uh, all right. So I got the album I'm listening to. And every song has that very soft feel to it. There's no teeth in any of the songs. All of McCartney's albums were very diverse, but they always had some material on there that had some, some teeth. Leave the McCartney solo albums out. McCartney and McCartney too. Ram had Smile Away, Too Many People. Uh, uh, I don't need to go through all of them, but the, each album, you know, Red Rose Speedway had something funky on there like Loop. Um, Band on the Run had Jet. 
Uh, they all had some teeth on them, but tug of war did. Uh, and as much as I loved the production at the time, as the years went by and I started hearing some of McCartney's more rougher, intentionally rougher recordings, driving rain, run devil run in no particular order. I grew to prefer the McCartney that was leaving a little, leaving some rough edges on his finished products, on his finished songs. And I started to like less the tug of wars and the flowers and the dirt, which were shined till, you know, till they, you know, had a perfect, you know, were produced till they had a perfect shine. Um, and going through the tracks on tug of war, um, you know, each one has huge pluses, but, you know, each song from my ears, my taste has a big minus. Um, Tug of War is a brilliant song, but again, you know, you got this, a uh, the, the, the lot of strings and brass and whatnot. And to me, it takes it in a different place. It takes it away from, you know, from maybe a more rock stage to something I don't know how to soft, you know, I'm going to use that word a lot. I think take it away was a great song. Uh, but even, even its execution was very polished. The vocals at the time, I love the harmonies, the way they were done to me, they sound uh, the horns and the backing vocals on take it away. Sound like they're overmodulated. Um, they're, you know, especially the horns, they're too like in your face. Um, Somebody Who Cares, I think, was my favorite song on the album at first. But that has things like lyrics, like uh, like somebody had taken the wheels off your car when you had somewhere to go. Well, it's annoying. What? <laughs> if I have to go somewhere and I go outside and my car is sitting on the rims, it's more than just annoying, Paul. I mean, that kind of thing that like that seemed like a very... Oh, they took my wheels. Boy, that's annoying. But somebody cares. Somebody loves you. Okay. It's a good song, though. I liked the song. And then it goes, what's that you're doing? To me, that was a classic missed opportunity for Paul McCartney, one of the great, if not the best bass player ever. And Stevie Wonder getting together. It needed a little bit of Stevie Wonder's uh, bite that he gave songs like... Uh, uh, living in the city, you know, in the vocals, Paul sings it so smoothly and safely. You know, how about breaking into a little bit of that uh, uh, vocal that he gave uh, "Call Me Back Again" or something like that, and uh, and and let the funk come out. Let you know, let's let it get a little sticky and greasy. It never does. It's clean. It's very shiny. <laughs> Uh, and then here today, I, I mean, I, I can't not hear today, but it, it was another song that I felt was uh, maybe because then the strings come in and not that I ever had any problems with McCartney with strings before. But for some reason on Tug of War, it suddenly became, I don't know, something that I would see on the late night variety uh, on a primetime variety show. Uh, flip it over. Ballroom dancing had so much potential, but that has that. Nursery rhymes. Uh, let's pet the dog and the kittens come. You know what I mean? Uh, when the guitar solos are supposed to come in there, they don't really go anywhere. The guitar part in the middle. You know what I mean? Dude, I, Ken is going to fall out of his chair in a minute. <laughs> uh, but I can preface all of these these opinions by saying. I love all these songs. It puzzles me why these qualities about them really bugged me. Uh, the Pound is Sinking was kind of cool, but that had that kind of, you know, kind of, but that song I liked, I remember. Wanderlust I liked. Um, get it. I never got it. I mean, <laughs> Carl Perkins is genius, but uh, there's still something a little too... Uh, you know what the word, what the phrase I keep thinking of? Um, remember the very first, maybe it was the first, it was one of the first, if it wasn't the first, Beatle documentary we all enjoyed in the 80s, The Complete Beatles. Remember that uh, documentary? Everyone had that videotape. I still have mine. 
haven't watched it in decades. But there's a scene where Jerry Marsden of uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers is explaining what was happening in Liverpool at the time, how the kids in Liverpool were picking up on the American R&B records and uh, blues records and how they were changing these traditional folk and blues tunes and things that they were hearing out of, out of, uh, out of America and some of the stuff happening in England and how they would turn them into skiffle songs. And he played a sampling of something. And he said, he plays a few a little bit of it. And he says, see, that was very acky dacky. He says, then we did this, you know, he goes into some, you know, basic rock guitar chords. Aki Daki always cracked me up. Get it is Aki Daki to me on the album. Um, uh, the rest of the record's great. I like be be what you see. Uh, be what be what I am. What be what you see? Yeah, I can't see. Can't read anymore. Why? Because that one was strange. That was. That I always kind of liked those short little interludes that McCartney did tend to throw in here and there. And Dress Me Up as a Robber, that was seemed to be like, that was a little, a little off the wall, a little off kilter. It appealed to me probably for that reason. And then Ebony and Ivory, strong song, but executed in a soft manner. Um, and that was a, that general opinion of Ebony and Ivory, of uh, Tug of War as a whole, the album as a whole, I could never shake it. And it was reinforced as the first half of the 80s wore on because Pipes of Peace was the same difference. And it made sense because a bunch of the tracks from Pipes of Peace came mm -hmm. out of the tug of war sessions. And to my ears, give a uh, movie aside, give my regards to Broad Street as an album is the same continuation of that sound, that vibe and they were, it was all produced by George Martin. And that's why when I heard Spies Like Us in 85, mm -hmm. that to me was a very ordinary song. Paul probably wrote it in five minutes for a movie, but it had balls. Uh, and nothing to Paul, or very little of what Paul had been putting out over the course of the first half of the 80s had those Balls uh, and Pipes of Peace. Uh, I'm sorry, Press to Play. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have released two albums with P and P in the same decade. It confuses me. Press to Play, I loved because it was the anti first half of the 80s. It was the anti say, 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 uh, average person, get it. Um, was it a great album? That's a, I liked it. But I may have liked it because it was a reaction. I, uh, it was it was a, a it, it was it was the exact opposite of what Paul had done three, four, five years earlier. Um, and to be honest with you, my opinions haven't changed all that much. I mean, I don't think Pipes of Peace. I think that is one of his weakest collection of songs. That doesn't help Pipes of Peace out. Tug of War on the other side of the coin. I get it. I get why it was praised. There are a lot of strong, strong uh, facets to it. And McCartney, the composer, is shining brightly on that album. Um, but uh, basically, that, that was it. Um, and I know I'm probably opened up and I, you know, don't, I, I want, I, I can't say this enough. I like Tug of War. It's just that it's got a feel to it that, didn't I didn't relate to when it came out and it you know when when the time comes to start listening to McCartney when I go to one of my binges I rarely stop in the early 80s I rarely stop in the 80s anymore you know I go from wings uh actually I go to from wings maybe to, all the way to run devil run sometimes you know and tend to kind of skip over the middle parts Okay. Shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you express yourself really well. And I will guarantee you that there will be a lot of people who will agree with what you're saying. And I've read comments similar to what you've just said, 
on other Beatles Facebook pages quite often. Um, just one recently had uh, the person say that the, he loves the rockin' side of Paul, the edgy side of Paul. And uh, apart from not really being impressed with much of his music <laughs> since, say, off the ground, this one person, you know, uh, he just, I know what you're saying about the production, but I've just, one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that the songs and the compositions of the songs are so much more important than the production. The songs matter. Songs are 90% of the recording to me. And great production can make them even better. I can love ballroom dancing and wanderlust if it's just Paul on a piano and nothing else. Okay? What George Martin brought to those recordings made them so much better. But still, the reason why I love Tug of War is because of the quality of the songs first. And George Martin's production was as perfect as could be. I don't mind shiny, glossy production at all. Um, I would mind it if that's all Paul did from tug of war on through the rest of his career, but he goes in different directions. And, you know, I love the rock inside of Paul. I love the edgy side of Paul, but then I like the, the saccharine side of him too. And I'm proud to say that mm -hmm. I do like, you know, the ballady stuff that he does. I like stuff that has a lot of strings to it. You know, Through Our Love is a song that I mentioned quite often here on this show, which a lot of people think, oh, it's so overproduced. Yeah, which one? Through Our Love. Through Our Love. You know, I know it's not. Well, that's a song. Love, that That's such a brilliant song. Yeah. That that just busts through all of the production for me. That's okay. one that, you know, that from my ears does what you're saying. The song is the main thing. That yeah. one is, that's heavy. Through Our Love. Yeah. But I think, you know, one of the biggest reasons why I've loved Paul is that he's so musically diverse. He's all over the place. There are times when I crave the rockers. You know, as I've said about Flowers in the Dirt, which is my favorite McCartney album, the only complaint I have to make about it is that I wish that there was a rocker in there and, and figure of eight, that version doesn't rock enough for me that's on the album. We Got Married doesn't with David Gilmore on uh, guitar. I know what you're saying, though. How much? Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the Bob Clear Mountain version, the single version of Figure of Eight. Yeah, that's... You know, I'd rather hear that than hear the version that's on Flowers in the Dirt, which I still love. I know what you're saying, but if every album that Paul made after Tug of War was exactly like that sound, that George Martin sound, eventually I would start to get tired. But he didn't do that. And all the different producers that he's worked with since then have their own sound. And I think that that's influenced a lot of McCartney's music. You know, Press to Play doesn't sound like anything that he did before. And then Flowers in the Dirt doesn't sound like Press to Play. Off the Ground doesn't sound like Flowers in the Dirt. You know, Flaming Pie was another direction, much more stripped down. Um, in terms of production, but McCartney is so diverse. That's what I like about him. I don't mind hearing the softer sound of him. Um, somebody who cares, like I said, is, is vintage McCartney, just like Through Our Love is. Um, I, will, I will say one thing, and this is something that I think we brought up here and I certainly have on, on Talk More Talk, but um, when you have the great talent that I think Stevie Wonder is. He's one of the greatest geniuses to me. What's that you're doing was a jam. You know, it wasn't, in my estimation, a serious piece of work, but it's what the two of them could cook up together, have some fun in the studio, but it still sounds great. And I love Paul's vocals on there. When that album first came out, there were moments on what's that you're doing when I couldn't tell one from the other. Okay. But, you know, I just wish when you, it's kind of like what's been said about the Rockestra theme. 
you've got all these great musicians in the studio with you and you come up with something that simple and I enjoy it. I love the rock history, but when you think of the caliber of all the people there in the studio and what you could do, it's the same thing with what's that you're doing. I would give anything in the world that Paul and Stevie Wonder made an entire album together with serious collaborations, songwriting collaborations. So, but still, it all comes down to me with the quality of the songs. And I think Tug of War is, you know, it's, I think that Paul has about 10 or 11 11 albums that I would consider to be great. Tug of War is, it's like number five or six in his entire canon, mm-hmm. which is saying a lot. Alan, before we go to you, uh, one, one quick thing I want to just jump in and kind of, I've actually find it fascinating that I feel like Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder were taking the same route together in the early 80s, because it seemed like after Stevie Wonder was hotter than July album in 80, um, his music also uh, and his output slowed down. But the music that he put out after Hotter Than July uh, in 80 um, seemed to lose bite. Uh, And you rarely ever hear uh, people talk about the albums that followed that. There aren't all that many. Uh, And I'm disappointed that Stevie has, for whatever reason, sort of stopped making new music. But there's nothing that Stevie did uh, post Hotter Than July that I think uh is good <laughs> not bad. i can't think of an, another word <laughs> it's there you know they oh, man they're, you know they're, and and but paul snapped out of that soft period uh stevie wonder did ebony and ivory with paul and i just called to say i love you and uh that's what friends are for and kind of stevie wonder stayed there uh becoming yeah. that light fm act Elton John ended up in that area, too. Yes, I know exactly what you're saying. And Elton John, uh, there were so still some brilliant shining moments that popped out every uh, fairly often. But for, you know, for every uh, um, for every uh, dirty little girls that he did in uh, in, in the uh, in the 70s, there was, uh, you know, I can't think of a. You know, the 80s were a soft decade for Elton. So it wasn't, it was just, it could be just a thing. Brilliant musician, very diverse talent. Decades go by, you're going to go in peaks and valleys and, you know, anyway. That's very Alan, Well, okay. Alan, comment. I, I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little later about what you said. I thought you put, did you put the bunt sign on there, Ken? Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Oh, Alan, go ahead, Alan. You know, I, I don't know that I had any more to say. Um, <clears throat> I, it was interesting hearing what it was that you didn't like about, uh, about this. And uh, it, it, none of that really bothered me. Um, but, you know, as, as you were saying it, I was sort of looking for something on there that, you know, might have teeth. I mean, certain aspects of Take It Away does, and um, maybe even a little of ballroom dancing, but just in terms of being driven. Um, but I, I, I know what you're looking for, and those aren't it. So, um, yeah, I hadn't really thought of it that way. It's, it was an interesting perspective. Um, yeah, there's, another, there's also another thing. It could be for me, just simply a personal thing, a life thing it, you know it came out at a, t- at a certain time in my life at 17 years old where maybe musically i was looking for something different mm-hmm. you know and 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 mccartney wasn't meeting it during that period of time uh, i don't know i've often thought that because those with those years you know you're reaching your late teens and it's also very- and 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 mccartney may not have been delivering the type of music that i wanted uh, as my soundtrack, whereas in the seventies, you know, wings the sun rose and set on wings, and still to some extent does. That you know, those growing my youth growing up in the seventies, listening to wings, I get the same emotional fear attachment. I have the same emotional attachment to that material today as a thirty-five year old. 
Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it may not have been what my ears wanted from Paul in the early 80s. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Interesting. It also, I think, was the first McCartney album to come out on CD. Um, and when I say first, I'm talking about in Japan, because that's where they were made at first, uh, almost exclusively. I mean, I think in Holland as well. But um, when CD started in uh, like late 83, 84, um, there were really just a couple of shops in New York that even had any. And uh, I used to um, spend my lunch hour walking between those few shops and buying whatever I, I could get and um, found Abbey Road, the Japanese version of Abbey Road, which is now called the Black Triangle version. It's uh, apparently rare and um, pricey. Glad I have it. Um, Why do you call it Black Triangle? I don't know. Okay. I, don't, I don't even remember there being a Black Triangle on it. Maybe there was on the disc. Um, but for some reason that one is, is very prized, um, sounded okay. Um, and, and tug of war as well. Those were the first two Beatles related CDs that I was able to find and, um, review them for Beatle fan, um, really? which, which would have been the first two CD reviews in Beatle fan. Um, because I felt guilty. Um, I had written, <laughs> I'd written Bill King um, a letter sort of very critical of various aspects of Beatle fan, um, including things like, um, you know, not enough white space. It makes it really hard to read, you know, when the type goes like edge to edge and, and all of that. And, and he wrote back a a very defensive letter. And, and I felt, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. Um, I just got these two things. Why don't I review them? <laughs> so, so that, that actually started my career at Beatle fan <laughs> and, and I'm still a contributing editor. So I actually, um, uh, last year was able to get, I don't recall where I bought them from uh, Beatle fan had done two hardcover volumes mm. Yep. Uh, like with an orange and pink. Press. What was but, that? Bayerian Press put them out. Yeah, yeah, where they were collect. They collected a certain number of the first issues mm. in two vo- hardcover volumes. So when we're done here, I'm going to go upstairs and go dig through looking was, for. I think it was after that. Oh, it was well. I, we'll see how far those go up to. It yeah, wasn't eighty two. Yeah, it was them. more like eighty four. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if. Oh, that's true. Because the CDs wouldn't have been <laughs> released right away. So. Yeah, I got to check. But anyway, that's interesting. And and then, of course, uh, Broad Street coming out on CD with all the extras. Right. That that I didn't like because I was a very much a vinyl, my vinyl, you know. To, yeah. Oh, but look at the C, Look at the CD. It's got all this extra stuff in here. Even the cassette had extra stuff. Mm-hmm. But so listen, that's uh, our take on Tug of War. Um can I just comment? Because I wanted to say something about what you said about Elton John and all and Stevie Wonder. Um, I will definitely say very this is painful for me to admit, since I love Stevie Wonder, his heyday in the 70s, he produced incredible albums consistently. Yeah. You know, so solid from, you know, track by track. The 80s through today, and he takes forever to make an album. You know, there are some really good songs that he's put yeah. together. But I, I wouldn't want to group them all together, you know, like it's all I just called to say I love you, which I love the song anyway. But he has done some other really good material. I mean, Ribbon in the Sky, I think, is one of his greatest That's songs. a beauty. But Ribbon in the Sky is also... That's late 70s, is it not? No, that's the music... The Music Aquarium original. Oh, the, the compilation. Yeah, that's right. That's that's early 80s. But it was one of the new songs on there. Yeah. Um, you know, Overjoyed is a great, great Stevie Wonder song. Well, what what you're girl. doing is you, you're singling out brilliant songs. Yeah. But I'm not going to say that those were completely brilliant albums. You're right. It's and and it's actually, the other thing is the, his output. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very disappointed with the fact that, you know, I'm looking at his discography now. And since 1980, uh, 
eliminating some soundtracks and some and a live album, you only have like in square circle characters, conversation piece, mm-hmm. a time to love. A time to love came out seventeen years ago. That's it. I know, I know what you're saying. Strange. Anyway. Um, but the only other thing about Elton John, and I, I I bring this up because occasionally here and in the podcast shows that I do, I always bring up how radio top 40 radio gradually phases out the older artists as they get older regardless of how good their singles may be a lot of older artists were looking for other formats of radio that would give them airplay nobody ever did a better job at getting on adult contemporary radio than elton john consistently (laughs) single after single to the point where and i like a lot of those songs is very formulaic Mm -hmm. i still love the songs yeah. Paul McCartney was never like that. You know, he could he could put out singles that fit that format, but he didn't stay that way. You know, and in some ways that could have hurt his record sales. You tell me. I mean, every time you hear Kiss the Bride, not maybe maybe not Kiss the Bride, Nikita. Uh-huh. Or 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 I guess that's, that's why, why they, they call it the blues. Yeah. Don't you picture yourself in the dentist's office waiting room? <laughs> I still like those songs. Yeah, no, no, I'm not saying, but but they're kind of good memories. And and if it was just a checkup, but if it was (laughs) pulled, it was like, you know, I don't ever want to hear this song again. Do you feel that, Mr. DeVivo? Yes, I do. Mm. Uh, Anyway, we should probably rap. Okay. My name is Darren. Sorry. (laughs) We should probably wrap up the show. But I still think that Tug of War is one of his best. So that's just, no Shut up, Darren. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, we're wrapping up. So that's uh, uh, so uh, anyway, um, wrap it up. So with Alan. Okay. Tell us all about Alan. <laughs> you can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, and we have a two Facebook pages as a group, Things We Said Today, big surprise, and Things We Said Today, Beatles radio fans. We have a Twitter feed, which is at Things We Said Fab. Um, <clears throat> and you can contact us by email at Things We Said Today, radio show, all one word, at gmail.com. Um, you can find the shows. We hope you're watching this one on YouTube because it's, you know, got the spiffy video. Um, and, uh, but we're also on Podbean, the uh, audio version, and the audio version is on um, iTunes and all kinds of other places. Um, so take your pick, get a different one each week, subscribe to us on all of them. And um, there we are. All right. Ken, you're up. Okay, the other podcast show that I do, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We just did a show um, in which each of the co-hosts listed their top 10 John Lennon solo songs that they can't live without. Kind of our desert island discs. So we all came up with our own list. We talk about a lot of what's going on in the news. And just like we discussed Paul McCartney's set list for the got back tour we did the same thing on talk more talk you can uh view that show on our youtube channel and it's on every single platform imaginable (laughs) you name it uh podbean spotify iHeartRadio. radio it's on all of them um if you can please subscribe to that show and um i do that show with kiddo tool tom hunyadi and joe mayo Also on uh, my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, a few new videos I put up, our colleague, Al Sussman, I did a show with him, looking back at 1964 and New York Radio and Mm -hmm. the Beatles invasion of America and what that was like. And uh, it's great to talk to Al who remembers WABC and WMCA and what it was like in those days and I will repeat the same thing I said on Talk More Talk. One thing that I thought was really fascinating. We all know that I Want to Hold Your Hand hit number one in the U.S. right before the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show, right there in the beginning of February. In New York, 
it was number one the first week of January. <laughs> we latched on to the Beatles faster than they did nationally overall. Um, I'd be curious to find out in the biggest markets if it was all that way. Have to do more of a study on that. But um, that first half of 1964 is so fascinating with how the Beatles dominated the singles charts. We also go into songs that that John and Paul gave to other artists like Peter and Gordon and Billy J. Kramer. And uh, just looking back at that time of what New York radio was like, great to have Al on as always. And we're hoping to have Al on again with you, Darren, to share radio memories of the Beatles. And of course, you're welcome to Alan, if I can get you to volunteer. <laughs> um, also, I had Skylar Moody on my channel. I met Skylar at the Fest for Beatles fans. We were on a uh, Beatles media panel. Skylar is a young Beatles fan in her early 20s, and she has a TikTok channel with a lot of Beatles content on it. She explains what tic TikTok is all about for all of us older folk that don't know what it is. And um, she's got a lot of young fans turning them on to the Beatles and sharing their feelings about the group. That's did also you do a TikTok on TikTok video. I, after that, did you do your own TikTok video, Ken? No, no, I didn't. I'm waiting for Skylar to invite me. Too bad. And finally, just before we recorded this show, um, I did a really wonderful interview with a guy named John Harris. John has spent 30 years um, doing a lot of audio production and mixing for a lot of TV shows, big TV events like the Grammy Awards, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Oscars. And as far as working with the Beatles, he started working with George Harrison for Live in Japan, mixing it with him, spending some time at Friar Park with him, going over the songs. He also has done a lot of work with Paul McCartney on uh, certain things like Paul is Live. Uh, he was there for the broadcast of Change Begins Within, the David Lynch event for a transcendental meditation at Radio City Music Hall, um, the benefit for Sandy at Madison Square Garden. We talk about all these things and we did that for two hours. He's a massive Beatles fan. He talks a lot about Jeff Emmerich and what Jeff Emmerich has meant to him and how he's influenced him, as has George Martin, obviously. Um, but most of his work has been from recording live events as opposed to recording in the studio. And um, he has a most impressive resume. And he was a, a fantastic guest. That video is about to be uploaded tonight on uh, what day is this? Wednesday. So it'll be up there Wednesday night. And so, oh, one more thing. Um, I had Sean Ross on my channel recently. Sean is a radio veteran who's, who's uh, written for Billboard magazine and um, radio and records. He has his own news column, Ross on Radio. It's all about what's going on in radio these days. We did a show on whether or not radio is still relevant. He asked me to get together with two other uh, Beatles DJs, veteran DJs, Joe Johnson, who has Beatle Brunch, and Andre Gardner, who for many years hosted Breakfast with the Beatles in Philadelphia, most recently on WMGK. And we did a Beatles radio panel, all talking about our radio shows, how it all started, our love for the Beatles, what we thought of Get Back. All kinds of stuff is in that video, which will also be, be going up tonight, be uploaded tonight. And that's all on Ken Michaels Radio. Uh, please subscribe to that channel if you can. And finally, my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Beatles trivia every single week. You can win one of 10 great prizes. And there's a Beatle game called Writings on the Wall, named after the George Harrison song which tests your knowledge on something that you might read in the packaging of a Beatle or solo Beatle album. So visit the website as well, kenmichaelsradio.com. Okay, that was as long as the news, I think. <laughs> oh, I thought this was the news for next show. No. Uh, and as for me, I'm on uh, the radio at WFUV. Uh, if you're in the New York City metropolitan area, we're at 90.7 FM. Um, and then of course, anywhere uh, I guess anywhere in the world, you can listen online at WFUV.org or get our app. 
and download that. And you could listen there. Uh, and if you have a smart speaker, you could ask it to play WFUV. If you don't have a smart speaker, you could still ask it to play WFUV, but nothing's going to happen. Um, and you can hear me Monday through Thursday nights starting at 10 o'clock uh, and Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4. If you want to send me an email personally, uh, write me at WFUV. The address is, uh, I, I think you can get away with ddevivo at WFUV.org or spell out Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org and look for my two Facebook page, pages, uh, Darren DeVivo. And um, I should actually rename it, call it the other page. But there's two of them. You'll find me. Just go, Just do a search. And that's about it. And that's it for this edition of Things We Said Today. For Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, I'm Darren DeVivo, and we will see you again in uh, a couple of weeks. Be well. Take care.